last session we started uh, at least trying to understand what's happening inside a deep neural network. Uh, by the way, the methods that I'm covering here and the methods that I've been covering so far in the course, yes, they are under the umbrella of the application being computer vision, but these techniques are really general. For instance, densely connected neural networks, you can apply them for uh, language modeling and reinforcement learning as well, or even recommender systems, or even speech. You can try to visualize and understand the recurrent neural network as well. You can try to make it more efficient by pruning and quantization. So these techniques, yes, they are under the umbrella of the main application being computer vision, but you can apply to different frameworks. So these are really generic techniques. The next one is actually even more generic. Yes, it's under the umbrella of computer vision, but it's a general question that you can ask from any classifier. Let it be a neural network, let it be a convolutional neural network, RNN, etc. And the question is, why should, why should I trust you? Here's an example. This is a, I'm giving you two algorithms. They are trained on unigrams. Unigrams uh, correspond to words, single words in your sentences. And you want to differentiate Christianity from atheism. Uh, and there are two algorithms, the one on the left, the one on the right. The document that these two algorithms are receiving are the same. So that's the input sentences or input document. And the task is to classify it as Christianity or atheism. The first algorithm, the document is from paul at verdicts.com. The name is Paul Durbin. The subject is replying to David Koresh is God. So that was the subject. Then there is an NNTP posting host. There's a host, there is an organization, Verdict Corp, and there are eight lines in the document. The first algorithm is considering the following words to be important in the email. God, mean, anyone, this, Koresh, through. And then it's gonna predict it to be atheism. Algorithm two is predicting, predicting it also correctly, and it's focusing on posting, host, RE, by, in, and NNTP. So the question is, which algorithm do you trust more? The first. And why is that? Uh, the second algorithm seems to be focusing on words that don't seem relevant to either Christianity or atheism. Mm -hmm. And the opposite is true for the first algorithm. So yes, exactly. That's correct. So by looking at the words that an algorithm is focusing on, we can build more trust in the prediction of that algorithm. You can have a similar example uh, for images. So let's say that's your original image. And if you have an algorithm that is telling you, I'm explaining, I'm seeing an electric guitar, and it shows you this part of the image, you're going to build more trust into the algorithm. But if it were to focus on the head of the dog here, then probably, and predicting it to be an electric guitar, we wouldn't trust it. If it's saying that I see an acoustic guitar and it's showing you the body of the guitar, then we are building more trust into the algorithm. And if it's e explaining a Labrador, it should show us the face of the Labrador. So does this make sense? Now the question is, how are we gonna achieve that? We know that neural networks are not interpretable in their original format. Actually, in the previous paper, we saw some uh, good results trying to explain the predictions of a neural network when it comes to an image. But we know that, for instance, a linear model is explainable because you can take a look at the weights on the features and the ones that have the highest weights are probably the most important ones for that particular prediction. So linear models are explainable. Another explainable model family are trees. You have a decision tree and the way that decision trees work is that you pick your features one after another. Let's say the first feature is sex, and then you divide it into male and female. And then you take a look at the category of all of your data sets that belong to the category of male. You pick another feature, for instance, age. If the age is belonging to the category of teenagers, then you go to the left. If it's, uh, I don't know, bigger than uh, 20 years old, you are going to go to the category of right, etc. And that way you're going to build a tree. But then the tree is interpretable. You say, 
for this particular prediction that we are making, these features were important by traversing your tree backward. But that's not the case for a neural network. The idea of this paper is that maybe you can use a linear model to explain the predictions of a neural network, which is a nonlinear function locally. Maybe locally things are linear. Maybe locally near our observations, locally near this particular image or this particular data or document. Things are linear and then you can say, these features were the most important ones according to that linear model. So that's the idea of this paper. So we are uh, taking help from a model that is inter interpretable. Let's see how it goes. I'm gonna go into the math and introduce some notation, but you get the idea. There, there is gonna be two models. One is a neural network model or any other classifier, and you have an interpretable model. And the algorithm is actually really famous. It's called Lime. You can find the corresponding package in uh, Python, and it's about local interpretable model agnostic explanations. So it doesn't care that your model is a neural network or not. X, in our case, is going to be the original representation of an instance. For instance, your documents are going to be represented in unigrams, for instance, or your image is going to be represented in terms of pixels. So the image is what I just said. It's a tensor with three, con three color channels per pixel, and your text is a bunch of word embeddings. So you have a bunch of words in your text, and you are going to embed them into a lower dimension, and that's going to be your word embedding. And that's going to be X. Depending on the type of the data, you're going to have different types of X. The interpretable model, the input to it, is going to be D prime dimensional, and it's either a zero or a one. What is that? For instance, in the case of an image, zero means the absence, and one means the presence of a super pixel. And there are algorithms to give you the super pixels. For instance, this is a super, super pixel. It's a collection of pixels. This is another super pixel. And your image is going to be decomposed into many super pixels. So yes, super pixel is a contiguous patch of similar pixels. For a text, you can have the presence or absence of a word, the presence or absence of God, the presence or absence, absence of mean, anyone, etc. So you can take a look at your dictionary and uh, there are some words in your dictionary. Some of them are present in your document, some of them are not. So our interpretable model is going to take X prime as an input and X prime is interpretable. You're going to have a class of interpretable models, for instance, linear models or decision trees. These are interpretable and any member of that family, we are going to call it an explanation. It's a model that we are going to uh, use locally to interpret a particular prediction. And we know that the domain of G is the set zero one to the power D prime. So it's a vector where it's a, it's a D prime dimensional vector and its components are either a zero or a one, the presence or absence of a feature. So that's the domain of G. And we are not looking for a complicated G because we want it to be interpretable. So we need to have a measure of the complexity on our explanations. I'm gonna give you an example pretty soon. For instance, you can have the number of non-zero weights in a linear model. That could be a measure of the complexity or the depth of a decision tree. That could be, because if you have a decision tree and you have no limit on the depth, it's gonna overfit. You can overfit any data. So we need to have a limit on the depth of the tree. And we are gonna have a measure of the complexity that we are gonna penalize. We want to have a model that's explaining our data. And at the same time, we want it to be a simple model. That's a concept in machine learning called Occam razors. Okay, and what is our original model? This could be a neural network that takes the inputs in the form of images or text and, up and outputs the class, the class probability. And that's the model that we want to explain. And f of x is the probability that x belongs to a certain class. Okay, we need something else. Given a data point, we want to look at only the other data points that are close to the current data point. For instance, given this image, we want to give more weights to the images that are close to this and give less weights to the images that are far from this image because we want to have a local data set to fit the G to it, the simple model to it. And we're gonna have a loss function 
and that's going to be how unfaithful G is in approximating F in the locality defined by our proximity measure. So things are going to be clear very soon. So this is our objective function. Somebody gives us an image. We are going to find a model in the family of interpretable models that are as they are that are not too unfaithful from the predictions made by F. And we want them to be simple. We want to penalize the complexity of the model. And to make things more concrete, let's make an example of what type of G we can work with. For instance, you can work with linear explanations and we want them to be sparse. It means that we want to have as few nonlinear weight, non-zero weights as possible. And that's just a linear model. A prediction goes in, you have some weights, Z prime is just uh, a bunch of values that are corresponding to the presence or absence of a feature. We are multiplying it by a bunch of weights. And if we make our weights to be sparse, then we are gonna pick out the features that are really important. For instance, if uh, many of these values, many of these super pixels are zero, we are focusing on a particular super pixel and that's gonna be our prediction, the most important feature. And what is the measure of our proximity? So this exponential function is nice. If the distance between two points, X and Z, is far from each other, if two points are really far from each other, then uh, this is gonna be a huge value. It's gonna be a huge, even, even more huge when you square it. So that's a huge positive value. You multiply it by a negative and the exponential of negative infinity is zero. So this function is like this. For the points that are close to your X, you're gonna put more emphasis on them. You're gonna have a higher weight. And for the points that are far from it, you're gonna put a very low weight on them. So it's the proximity measure that we have up there. And some examples are cosine distance for text and cosine distance is just you take the inner product of two vectors. That's gonna give you the distance or you can have L2, L2 distance for images. And what is our L? We want F of X, the predictions made by F on Z to be as close as the predictions made by G, the simple model in L2 sense. And we are only looking at the points Z that are really close to our original data set, original data point. So we want the predictions. And by the way, the predictions are the same. So this linear model is going to predict electric guitar. And this nonlinear model is going to predict electric guitar as well. But things are local because of this assumption, because of the proximity measure. And the measure of complexity is that you want to have a limit on the number of words or super pixels that are zero, that are non-zero, sorry. We know that L0 norm is gonna compute the number of non-zero terms. So we want to have the number of non-zero terms. If it's bigger than a particular number, we are gonna penalize with infinity. If it's smaller than K, then we are gonna be happy. We have as few non-zero terms as possible. So that's gonna be your loss function. It's gonna be this L going in here and you're gonna have a penalty. So visually speaking, what are we doing? You have a very complicated classifier classifying these circle dots from these pluses. But then somebody gives us a particular instance, a particular example, for instance, for this particular image or this particular document, that's gonna be this plus here. Pi is gonna help us give more weights to the data that are close to this uh, image of interest or this data point of interest and less weight to the ones that are really far. So they're very, the size of these uh, symbols is specifying how important they are. Now you want to have a linear model that is approximating your nonlinear model locally and is able to make the same predictions as your nonlinear model. The ones on the right of this line are being classified as blue. The ones to the left of this line are being classified as a red. So locally, around that image of interest, we are approximating the nonlinear model with a linear one. So is everything clear? Any questions so far? I'm curious about these super pixels and um, if they, they must exist only for one image, because how would you say like you have the super pixel of like a dog's face and expect that to be present in any other image? So that's a great question. What are we doing now? We are focusing on particular data point. So it's gonna be a 
that image that we are considering and we are trying to explain. Okay, so these these super pixels are not generalizable. It's not like the it's not the presence of a dog's face as a super pixel within any image, but just this one in particular. Just this particular image. Um, the other question I had was about this cosine distance for text. That usually is with like you have a um, vector embedding for every word, and then you take um, then you take the 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 cosine between those those angles, or you find the angle using like the the dot product. So what in embedding are they using here? Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about text. Let's say you have this one we're going to cover next semester, but for this particular paper, uh, for text, you're going to have a vocabulary, a dictionary of words that you can refer to. And let's say you have 1 million words in your dictionary. These are going to be categorical variables. For instance, God is going to be represented by a one hot vector, and by one hot, I mean only one of the entries of your vector is going to be one, and the other ones are going to be zero. And let's say the 256 index of your vector is a one, and the rest of them are zero. And that's going to be a representation for God. But as you can see, that's high dimensional. It's in, uh, I said you have a million vocabulary. That's the size of your vocabulary. And that's going to be a one dimensional, one million dimensional one hot vector. The way that you do it is you multiply that by a matrix to make the dimension smaller. And that matrix is your embedding matrix. Initially, you have a bunch of sparse vectors where you have only one value being non-zero. But after this operation, you're gonna get an embedding that is low dimensional, but you have the flexibility of having any real number. In that is, that, is that matrix the same thing as um, like say word to vec, which word to vec, which I've heard of? Um, is word to vec yes. linear, linear like that? Yeah, we are gonna cover that next semester, but yes. That's uh, you can do it, that's the general idea, but uh, you have different types of algorithms for training it. Yeah, yeah. but at the end- and one of them is word to vec. You can I, I, was, I did not know that they were linear embeddings, that it would be a matrix multiplication. I thought that they were themselves um, neural network embeddings. No, for word, uh, word to work, it's linear. It's cool. linear embedding. And you have nonlinear embeddings. That's the big picture. And that's going to be the representation that you have for your text. And then the one last question I had was about this um, omega of G in the sparse linear explanations part. So is this saying that there's just an infinite penalty if you go over the, I don't know, the word counts or go over the super pixel counts and then there's zero penalty otherwise? Exactly. So it's either infinity or zero. Okay. So the thing is that that's your budget of the number of non-zero terms in your weights. Got it. Linear one. And that's a penalty that you're putting. So you're not even you're not even then incentivizing s simpler models as long as they're below a threshold. It wouldn't matter if you have two parameters or four parameters as long as it's underneath the threshold of of ten or whatever you choose. Yes, that's correct. But this is not uh, differentiable, so probably you're gonna approximate it with a sigmoid. Okay. When you do your training, and this infinity is just a big number. It's yeah. not infinite. It's the mathematical formulation, but when you implement it, it's gonna be different. Got it. Okay. But the big picture here is that you have a linear model and you're using it to approximate a nonlinear model locally. And because the keyword is locally, mm -hmm. because it is local, it is doable because some observations are going to have more weight compared to the others. And once you have that, it's game over because now you can take a look at your W. It's a weight on your super pixels and you keep only the ones that are the most important. And that way you can interpret this particular image the predictions on this image is this clear to everybody okay perfect are you going to talk now about how to choose these super pixels or is it similar to what we did last time uh, the super pixel is uh, not about deep learning so you can have it's a computer vision thing so given any image you can compute the super pixel and there are algorithms to do that okay. so it's a computer vision algorithm it has nothing to do with deep learning but uh, there is a difference between trusting a model versus trusting a prediction. So now we are, yes, we trust this prediction, but how are we going to trust your model in general? Basically, we now trust the prediction of our model on this particular image or on this 
documents, but how are we gonna trust, trust our model in general? And the idea is simple, I guess you guys can think of it. It's not too complicated. If you can trust like a, a large number of predictions, then you can trust the model. Exactly. So you're going to take a look at your test data, the prediction of your model on a family of examples, and then you're going to build trust in your model as a whole. And there is actually a section in the paper, I'm not going to go into more details about how things are going to work, but I'm going to give you the big picture for the details you can refer to the paper. You have a bunch of features and you have a bunch of documents in your data set. For instance, the features could be your words, or these could be images and the features could be super pixel. So we're gonna, actually the paper is gonna devise an algorithm that's gonna pick out a couple of observations, not a couple, actually more observations among your entire data set that cover more of the features. For instance, this example is covering feature two and three. This example is covering features four and five. If you show the user, of your algorithm. These two examples, it's gonna help them trust your algorithm. Why? Because it's covering most of the features that are important in the algorithm. It's covering F5, F4, F3, F2, and the only feature that you're missing is F1. Yes, the perfect scenario is to show the predictions for all of the documents, but then it's gonna become boring. You want to show them the important documents. And that's gonna be through a weight matrix. It has the size of your data, times the size of your features, d prime. And in the case of this linear model here, you have WGI for a particular example. You take a look at the J, because it's gonna be a vector, you're gonna take a look at the J element, and that's gonna be WIJ. These are the entries that you see here. And there is a peak algorithm. It's a peak procedure. It has nothing to do with deep learning because uh, this is actually an NP-hard problem to solve to show which documents to select and show them to the user. There's an algorithm in the paper that's gonna tell you how to pick, how to avoid the NP-hard problem. It's gonna be an approximate solution. That's a tough problem. It's NP-hard. You cannot solve it in linear time, in polynomial time. That means it's NP-hard. And, uh, but the big picture is that you are picking a couple of examples to show to your user, to the user of your algorithm. So any questions? I um, I'm confused how there is overlap of features across, like if your documents are pictures, and like we said, these super pixels are subsets of one particular image now. Like how, how do you then come up with a feature set, which is not just like a diagonal matrix? Um, I see what you're saying, but uh, you can have a vocabulary of the entire super pixels that are going to show up in your images, in your entire data set. The same way that you can have a vocabulary of all of the words that are appearing in your data set. Sure, but it seems like we, we reuse words in English and that's expected. All of the words I'm saying right now could be in any of the textbooks that I've ever read, but that combination of pixels that make that dog's face, I would be extremely um, surprised to find that that exact combination of pixels ever existed before or after this particular image. No, it doesn't have to be exact. Mm -hmm. You know that there is a face of a dog and uh, you can have multiple different dogs and that's fine. Okay. So that's that those, those algorithms you were talking about before for defining super pixels can find those kind of concepts. Yes. So it's trying to find concepts. Um, dog face, hand, ear, that kind of stuff. Exactly. So they, yes, a super pixel is not just a number uh, that has a value of red, green, blue. It has a meaning to it. Okay. The same way that your words have meanings. But the peak algorithm, I highly encourage you to read the paper. It's, inter it's interesting and it's going to tell you why it is actually a hard problem. But in the end, the objective of the peak algorithm is to pick examples that are going to cover most of the features that are present in your entire data set. And then the other question I had is um, kind of going back to what we were doing last time that certain parts of images, certain, so certain regions of images have a high importance to certain algorithms by um, choosing these super pixels beforehand with some other algorithm that's not tied into the learning. Aren't we perhaps um, like 
like what if the dog's face or the dog's hand or the part of the guitar was not actually important in the classification so aren't, aren't we throwing away then the power of the classifier that we were looking at last time with those heat maps of like what part of the image is actually important to the classification i think uh, these are two complementary approaches the one from before you are not taking help from any other model and that one is very cheap and it's going to help you visualize what's happening inside your classifier. Mm -hmm. But probably that is using features of uh, properties of convolutions. Mm -hmm. But this one is for any classifier. So that's a generic idea. Whenever you have a generic idea, it's not going to be as efficient as the algorithms that you design for to yeah. solve a particular problem. It's a that's generic a idea. That's a great point. Yeah, that, I guess that answers it exactly. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, perfect.